since I have had two psychotic breaks, not a yeah. single person from Netflix from that show have even contacted me or emailed me to ask me if I'm okay. If you play Yakira, then you play Marina Thompson, then who is Ruby Walker? <laughs> That's something that I've kind of been, you know, actively trying to explore and understand. I mean, I'm not even that young. I thought I'd lose my dad in my 40s when I lost him when I was 26. And I was like, oh my God. It was a really tormenting place for me to be because my character was like very alienated, very ostracized. I want to be independent. I want to be perceived as strong. No one really wants to be looked at as being vulnerable. That's amazing. Um, just to move it on to a, a lighter note. <laughs> 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 Welcome back to The Bakery, everyone. This is The Loaf Podcast, where we break bread with the world's finest. We're very lucky to be here today with Ruby Barker. She's most famous for her role as Marina Thompson in Bridgerton, but she's also featured in films such as How to Stop a Recurring Dream as the main character, Yakira. Ruby, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. How have things been lately? All good? Um, yeah, yeah, they've been good. It's been, mm -hmm. it's been like a kind of weird year. Um, but all in all, I genuinely have had a really good time. I've done lots of things, especially with Mind. I'm an ambassador for them, mental health charity. That's really cool. Um, I was at number 10. It was I saw that on Instagram. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. What was I, that like? It was like sort of going to the upper echelons of hell. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a follow back. You know, but I did follow you back. <laughs> really? Yeah. What, Ollie Walsh? Or my on your Instagram. Yes, no I did. No way. Respect. I don't know how I didn't see that. Right. Okay. That's okay. cool. Anyway, yeah. Um, tell us about what you're doing with mine then. What's that? So I'm an ambassador for them. So I'm just helping mm -hmm. them with um, campaigns, in particular the Racist Standard campaign, um, which I'm running right now. And we're asking for the government to reform the Mental Health Act before the next general election. And then we're mm. also asking them to really do a deep dive and look into the current state of mm -hmm. care in psych wards and also the resources, the amount of support and training that's there for staff. Mm. Um, we want people to have more of a say in their care. Um, Is this as part of the mental health, reforming the Mental Health Act? Or like which, yeah, you know, yeah. So, specifically are like? so the, the main thing that we're campaigning for is to mm -hmm. reform the Mental Health Act, but mm -hmm. the whole campaign race is standard. It, it's, we're, we've got so many demands basically. Um, as part of Raise the Standard. So it's not just a mental health fact that we want reforming. Mm -hmm. We want them to genuinely like investigate what's been going on in the past and then, you know, take the appropriate measures to improve things in the future for people. Whether or not that will happen, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe in a while, you know, we're working with, um, it's less of like a legislative thing. We're working with this thing called the Checking Co. I don't know if you know Matthew Johnson. Who's that? He's like a presenter on this movie. Oh, he's with Mind as well, actually. He's an ambassador. He's with Mind as well. Yeah, he's with Mind. He's basically, he's always a TV presenter for ITV. And he was one of the earliest guests we got on the podcast. And it was really exciting when we got to him. He's like 100K followers and mm -hmm. we're really gassed. But I think part of it is that we're a podcast, I think, and Ollie and I are quite focused on mental health ourselves. And yeah. um, I think raising awareness on that is, is important. It was Mental Health Awareness Day just last week. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 we paired up with Matthew Johnson and his charity kind of sticking posters around benches raising awareness for mental health and just getting people to check in with each other because i think yeah. just talking about it is is the most important thing yeah i i totally agree i sort of i do kind of feel like i'm this um acceptable face of mental health mm -hmm. do you know mm -hmm. what i mean could you what expand I well I, I i just sort of feel like um you know not to like blow my own trumpet, but yeah. because I look relatively kind of put together, together like, put together yeah, yeah. right now. It's true. You know? People are all for like mental health support, I feel often when like somebody's put together and yeah. they're talking about a difficulty and it's like, well, okay, but like if somebody has schizophrenia, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like it's a mess, like yeah, people don't like it as much. Yeah. But um you're quite big on like kind of checking in with this is the whole thing of the checking code. It's like checking in with yourself, self-talk, and you're quite big on that. What would be like your general tips to someone who's like you know, just like taking it easy and that kind of thing. Like, how would you speak to someone who's asking you for advice? Let's say. Um, what I would say is, well, what helped me the most, and it did take me a long time to sort of come mm -hmm. around to this, is exercise. 
exercising, that sort of routine of that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not like The Rock, you know, I'm not <laughs> Dwayne. I'm not up at five o'clock in the morning. And You don't you know, have to be. No, you don't have to be. Um, but just like moving, walking, um, and then slowly sort of implementing going to the gym if that's your thing or yeah. bouldering, indoor bouldering, outdoor bouldering and the people that bouldering sort is of so meet, fun. I it works. Right? It's yeah. really good. And and it's hard to stress about anything when you're clinging on falling. to a wall. Apart from falling and breaking <laughs> oh, that's your That stresses me. Like when there, like there was one time like the, somebody moved the mattress. You know, it's like the big crash mattress. Were you outdoors? No, it was like an inside thing. Okay. It, it's like actual like, you know, like rock climbing it. with like the holes. It's yeah, not like, yeah. would you do bouldering like actually on boulders kind of thing? Like, uh, no, that's too hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I know, right? It's this yeah, yeah. Basically in Morta, um, my, my best friend in Morta and his, his dad, his dad is like 50 and when we go swimming, He's just obsessed with rock climbing. And in Morta, I don't know if you can picture it, where it's like an island with these huge Lord of the Rings style rocks. Yeah, and, yeah. And he's this, this 50 year old man and he'll just start climbing and scaling these huge rocks. And then and then I try it. I'm like, well, if you can manage, surely. <laughs> and then you grab onto it and the fingers start bleeding and it's just incredible. It's on your feet is the issue. Yeah, as well. I don't know if you've done it like climbing out the sea, but like when there's like this sharp bits under the sea, it like, messes you up. So painful. I've not done So you've, you've done a lot of climbing outdoors. No, just like by the sea, like basically my grandparents live kind of by the sea. Okay. So just like climb up like one meter and jump out. So it's not like some sort of professional thing. Okay. Yeah. But um, just on the exercise thing, I think I found it helpful myself. And I'm, I think there is still stigma around mental health, but I think we've got to be open about that kind of thing. And, and I was wondering how exercise has helped you now in the last maybe two years and how you've, how you've kind of worked on your own. Mm. mental health through maybe exercise or through talking about it or awareness mm. well uh, well for me you know I, I went on to like a um, medication for my mental health mm. which literally I'm not joking turned me into a zombie really yeah yeah for real like I was I was on I was on this stuff and you know the name um or... it was olanzapine okay and the milligram of it it, it was so high you know, it's one of these drugs mm. as well. Like if you go into a psych ward or into hospital, this is the cheapest drug. And yeah, it will sort of bring people relatively back down to earth. So of course it really does get overprescribed, one yeah, might yeah. say. Um, they will just blanket, put them on that, you know. Um, so I was on this and when you're on it, you have to stay on it for a minimum of a year. For it to like become effective was like no, because if if you it. come off it, if you come off it early, then you run risk of then having another episode, wow. breakdown, whatever. Okay. Right. So you've got to stay on it for a year, but there is a huge correlation with these drugs, in particularly antipsychotic drugs, and extreme weight gain very, very quickly, because you never feel hungry, you never mm -hmm. feel full. Um. And it's really hard to get up and to move because you're just completely, there's, there's no one home. I mean, my friends would um, like video call me and stuff. And, you know, we talk about it now and they say there were times when we were on a phone call to you or a video call to you. And they were thinking, um, is there any, should we, should we just hang up? Because she's clearly not here. Wow. Do you know what I mean? We don't we yeah. don't want to hang up the phone because that that would just be Sorry. awful, which is clearly <laughs> not in just, the room. Just to give me context, when was when was this exactly period wise? Right. So this was immediately after I started shooting Bridgerton, okay. and then a year later I went back into hospital, which is the hospitalization that everybody knows about because that's the one that I spoke publicly mm -hmm. about. Um when I went into hospital a week after shooting Bridgerton season one, um, you know, that was really, really covered up and kept on on the download because the show was going to be coming out yeah and that's why you during the filming you said um well yeah i was getting on well during the film i was deteriorating oh, yeah. in the minute that we wrapped i mean Did you like, have, like good support with it or like I when know. i when i was shooting bridgerton um no you can't tell i'll say i put so i i admit i didn't watch bridgerton before we invited you yeah but i had like a binge watch okay maybe like two weeks ago okay you can't tell at all it was an amazing like genuine it was an amazing performance thank really you cool. i mean i think it kind of helped i mean really yeah yeah for sure i think like you know a lot of artists and stuff they suffer from mental health and i think it did kind of help me get into that headspace in that world but i mean it, it was it was a really tormenting place for me to be because my character mm. was like you know very alienated very mm. ostracized um on her own um under these horrible circumstances. 
and 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 the thing is with like Bridgerton, I'll tell you something. Not a sing, and I'm happy to talk about it now, but not a yeah. single person from Netflix, not a single person from Shondaland since I have had two psychotic breaks um, from that show have even contacted me or emailed me to ask me if I'm okay or ask me if I would benefit from any sort of aftercare or support, right? Mm. Nobody. And so, Mm, you know, I went into hospital the first time a week after I finished shooting and um, obviously the show on the run up to the show coming out, um, I was just then coming out of hospital because it took like a year in the edit. Um, my Instagram following was going up. I had all of these engagements to do. My life was changing drastically overnight. And yet there was still no support and there still hasn't been any support for that time, you know? Mm. And so I was trying really, really hard to... Um, you know, just just sort of act like, you know, this is fine, this is okay, I'm okay, I can work. It's not a problem. And that's why, you know, when you brought up um the pretty little thing. Yeah, that podcast, thing yeah, when yeah. when I'm there, like everything's so great, amazing. everything's fine. It's almost like I had this kind of metaphorical invisible gun to my head. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. To literally oh, to, to to sell this show because this show's bubbly and fun and all of these things. I don't want to come out and poo poo on that. Because then I might never work again. <laughs> yeah, you've got this like it's like contrasting forces going on. I feel. Yeah. So basically. so yeah, it's like you've got one side. You're like an actress, and you're also the face of even even if you're the face of mental health awareness, you can't look raggedy. You can't be sad. You can't look sad if you're yeah. raising. Isn't isn't that a bit of like this paradox? Where it's like emotional labor. If you're looking, if you're yeah. raising awareness for mental health. You can't look sad while doing it. Almost, I feel is is part mm. of it. You've got to be like, you've got to put in the, a, a certain amount of emotion into it, um, to to sell it. Yeah, and the narrative, the 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 narrative always has to be sort of like positive, mm-hmm. posi- mm-hmm. positive and hopeful. You know, while while we're living in this kind of this dystopia, I mean, that's yeah. how I feel anyway. You know, so it's a weird one. It's it's a weird sort of world to to navigate. But within all of that, you know, it's easy to get overwhelmed by things that we can't necessarily control. Um, but one thing that I can control is just moving. And I and I know I know that if I move, if I go, you know, taking a dog for a walk or I do a gym gym session, I don't make it through a gym session, however hard I decide to go that day, or easy or lax, whatever, I've done something which is um which is good for me and is good for my health, you know, that's enough. Yeah. yeah. The thing we were talking about, like emotional labor being like the front of mental health is making me think about in the interview we were talking about just before the film one, you said that you were like method acting. Yeah. Do you find that, is that like a form of escapism for you? Or like, how does, how does that function? Like when you properly get into the character? Because for example, Yakira mm-hmm. is like, you know, she kidnaps her younger sister and that kind of thing. Yeah. So obviously she's, you know, kind of losing it a little bit. Yeah. To method act, do you feel like you're getting into that mindset a bit too much? Like, do you feel like you're crossing a dangerous line? Well, um, yeah, that's interesting because there's a lot of problems, isn't there, with with um, with method acting? Um, and I think a lot of the time, because I was so young and um, I never had any sort of formal training, I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just um, instinctively. Mm-hmm. feeling out and doing whatever I could do to dial in the best performance possible. That's that's all that mattered to me was to um, authentically, of, authentically show um, the truth of, of the scene, of the moment, of, of the emotion, of their soul and who they were um and 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 do a good job i mean all i really have to give is is my feelings mm-hmm. and i i think that's that's why why i act and i think it i think it's also a weird kind of process of coming to understand what's going on in one's own head and one's own life but i've spent so many years playing different people I guess I got a little bit lost because I didn't really know who who I am. Yeah. Um, 
you know what I mean? Yes, like I was about, I was actually, it's a good point because I was about to bring up this question of identity. If you play Yakira and then you play Marina Thompson, then who is Ruby Barker? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's such a deep question. Yeah. Yeah. Like, who who is Ruby Barker? Right. And and that's something that um I've kind of been, you know, actively trying to explore and 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 understand. And one thing that I've been doing um since, you know, um my hospitalization last year was I started making music and stuff like that. That's been so therapeutic for me mm -hmm. like genuinely it's been great i what mean what kind of music are you making well it's it's it started off when i was in uh i was collaborating with my friend that i met in there and it was kind of like this it, it, it was like indie it was indie music right and since then it's gone into kind of um neo soul with jazz and rock influences um so yeah yeah, but I I love the the musical side of of things and that sort of exploration. Yeah. And it's nice because I don't have a script or a director telling me how I should think, feel, and act yeah. in a scene. You know, nobody's in control of that yeah. other than me. I mean, it's this thing I'm actually doing it for my course right now as part of a film film module that I'm doing for my course. It's the idea of directing somebody else actually affects their own sense of self because if you've got somebody else imposing on you what you should do and how you should act and maybe with music your own music mm. you have this ability to express yourself in in a much freer way yeah yeah and it, it's nice as well because being an actor you're so um you're reliant upon the industry mm -hmm. upon individuals wanting you and, and giving you a job it's it's such an insecure you know lifestyle um to have job to have Whereas with with music or or other forms of art like painting and stuff like that, I d I'm not waiting on a phone call or an opportunity for me to be able to be an artist and express myself. Yeah. Um. So that's really liberating. It's interesting what you say about like being an actor being such an insecure job. Yeah. Not insecure in the sense of like being personally insecure, but in terms of like job security, because like I guess what people only see is like you have like Leo DiCaprio and, and stuff. And get a movie whenever he wants but yeah obviously now you've sort of established yourself so it must be quite different but coming up especially because you didn't go to art um drama school sorry did you feel like you were like constantly fight like trying to fight for something did you feel like you were gonna fight like did you have that faith of finding something or like um it's funny because i actually uh i i feel that i was more successful before i'd established myself in in terms mm -hmm. of um landing work and stuff bridgerton, like that before bridgerton yeah yeah Okay. Really, honestly, How? like, um, well, I was getting. It, it's a hard thing, really, because there's been there's been COVID, right? That we had all the lockdowns, and then the industry's been on strike. The writers striked. Yeah. yeah. The actors are still striking. So, like, over eight percent of the industry's out, right? And America massively influences the industry here. So maybe I'm not being completely fair, and obviously I've been ill as well. But when I first started acting, um. I, I was just landing things, you know, even just little things like uh, BBC, BBC Doctors, um, well, CBBC. I saw, your, um, I saw your Royal Bank of Scotland one. Oh, no. How did you <laughs> find that? I was like, you know, just like doing research for the interview, just like YouTube. And then it was like you were doing an interview for like, it was like something, it was like some sort of play company or something when you were much younger. And then they like clipped in the Royal Bank of Scotland one when you were like 13, Did they? probably. Yeah. Okay. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the, the first thing I auditioned first for. First thing you ever did. Yeah. And then it was years before, you know, I, I started doing community theatre and mm. land, I landed a lot of jobs on the build up to Bridgerton. Um, I worked with Marissa uh, Marissa Abella, who's going to be playing Amy Winehouse. Wow. No way. Right. We met. Years ago, um, I played her best friend, Georgia, in the first episode of Cobra for Sky. And that was starring Robert Carlyle um, and like Lucy Kohu. So I did I did really interesting loads and loads of jobs and stuff um, on the build up. I can't remember the original question, yeah. but whatever. I know. Well, let's follow on then. I was just asking about like the fact that you didn't go to drama school, for example. Yeah. At Oxford, the reason I asked is that Oxford imposter syndrome is like a big thing. Like you can right, get talks okay. about it in the first week of like feeling like you're not good enough to be there and that sort of thing. Yeah. And obviously 
finding it hard to land jobs and stuff. Did you ever feel that kind of thing? Like you were almost out, out of place ever? Or? Yes, I did. Less so in film and television, more so in theatre. Theatre. Oh, okay. I yeah. feel like it's also because, this is my experience, but a lot of people who do theatre or there's a slight feeling that it's just, I know things that you don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel with maybe film and television, it's a bit different. Um, but yeah, I remember going to, to theater lessons when I was like 13 the first time. And I just thought, this is not for me. And I, I, just, I just moved away from that because acting was something that I was interested in when I was younger. But I guess it never materialized, partly because, well, Malta's Malta yeah. acting scene isn't very big. Although we do have like films um, All right. being, yeah. being filmed in the country. But like yeah. Maltese actors, you don't find many of them. But anyway, my point is I, with theater, I felt like there's this academic side to it. You know what I mean? This yeah, academic you side did Shakespeare, it. right? When you were coming up, is that correct? Or no? um, I, I, I wanted, my, my dream was mm. to work for the Royal Shakespeare Company on okay. stage in like Stratford. That, that was my goal. I worked with Philip Breen, um, Royal Shakespeare Company director in New York Mystery Plays. Um, that was in 2016. So that was, I think that was my second theater sort of role. Mm. Um, so there's like, there's a connection there with the theater, but um, I've never actually done Shakespeare. Okay. Did that not work out then with the, what's working at Stratford? Well, what kind of got in the way there? Um, well, what happened was um, I did, a, I did a lot of theater, like community theater and stuff. I had a really good time. And then, you know, I sort of had this realization, oh, oh, you know, this, this could be my job. I could get paid for this. The minute that that, my mind changed um, in regards to getting paid and making a living out of my art, um, it sort of became, I suppose, about survival. Um, Theatre's great and it's fun and all of these things, but you know, doesn't get, it's, it's much harder to go places, I guess. It's harder to go places and, and it doesn't really pay the bills. I mean, it is kind, yeah. it is kind of a privilege really to, to, to do it. That's probably suppose. why there is that academic side, to be honest. Yeah. Is it's like people who can, but talking about, obviously I'm sure Bridgeton did pay the bills. So, you know, but talking about Bridgeton, what I've heard is, and I don't mean this in a negative light, but what I've heard is from a lot of actors and actresses who get like a big role is when they're kind of known for that role and you kind of feel entrapped in it and it's like hard to move out of that. Do you feel that with Bridgeton, like getting recognised on the street, for example, and people are like, oh, like Marina Thompson kind of thing? Or yeah. I'm you. really glad that you brought up Yakira um, mm -hmm. from How to Stop a Recurring Dream because that's my proudest work really so far you know that's that's my baby and and kind of always being recognized for um marina i mean you know i, I did a good job and it was great and obviously that's the thing that everybody's seen but it is a little bit kind of like bittersweet as well because it's like mm. you've seen you've seen a little bit of what i can do i mean but i think what's really special is you know how old was i like when i played you i was like 19 years old and whilst the performance wasn't perfect, I still killed it. Yep. I mean, we, we saw bits of it and uh, we didn't watch the full movie, but we saw bits of it and it was amazing. And I will say the movie itself had flaws, yeah. but I will say that you were like the highlight of that. It was what, what made that movie like stand out was, it was your performance, not to, not to not keep humble, but I will say <laughs> that it was like really stand out there. And thank you. And, and yeah, I found it quite quite touching from from what we saw together while we were doing preparation for the interview, and I think there were some articles as well online that that shared that sentiment. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. And um, Kelly, who the little sister, she was yeah. played by Lily Lily Aslan Dogdo, the coolest surname ever. She <laughs> where's it from? Yeah. Um, her father. I don't know where she's from, but her father's Muslim. Okay. Okay. Um, she's mixed, but um, I saw on Facebook her mum put up the other day but she's in the uh, ambulance service now it's That's like crazy. studying wow. in, Watch in what a career ambience. transition yeah wicked wow yeah but like, about, sorry go ahead yeah talking about things like outside of acting as well you said music mm -hmm. i saw somewhere that you said you're writing is that right yeah what kind of things are you writing you like poems <laughs> screenplays like also yeah um like poetry poetry okay. i guess but a lot of the poetry is sort of trans 
transformed into songs and music. Mm. And then um, I actually had a funny idea. You know, I have I have lots of ideas and I end up writing bits and bobs and picking stuff, stuff up, putting it down for six months, picking it back up. Mm -hmm. But I had a cool sort of short film idea last night. So, last night? Uh, yeah. Tell us about it. Come on, come on. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready to pitch it, but basically... Um, my fella, he is an amazing chef, right? He's a great cook. This main character, you mean? No, no, like my my real life, my boyfriend. Oh, okay. oh sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Fella, he's a, he's I, didn't, a, I didn't get the term, but yeah. Sorry, okay, sorry, he, yeah. he's a great cook, right? Okay. He's really passionate about cooking and culinary stuff, and he's half Italian. And, oh, that must be nice. Right. I, <laughs> but the thing is, he's really good. Like, he makes all his own bread. He makes his own oils. That's amazing. Who has time to infuse their Is that your favourite bread, then? He, I love his like focaccia. We okay. always ask that yeah. question. We actually forgot this time, but that's like because we're the loaf podcast. Yeah, of course. We always begin with what's your favorite bread? Yeah, it's your boyfriend's bread. My my boyfriend's bread is great, but okay. he makes his own focaccia. He made that yesterday. He makes all his own pasta. It's nuts. He's really good at cooking. Um, puts me to shame. But one thing that's funny about it is, is that he's never cooked for his mum and dad. He's never cooked for his parents. Okay. And I'm like, but why? I'm like, why don't you cook for your dad? Your dad's coming home from Middlesbrough, whatever. Why don't you cook for him and show it? And he's like, no, no. And I, and I sort of said, it's so weird. It's almost like you have to come out the closet as a chef. <laughs> yeah. You know, like what, what, what I is wish I had this? that privilege. Isn't that funny? I'm a pesto <laughs> pasta merchant, personally. Because <laughs> also in here, well, basically, let's keep this kind of off the record because it's Christchurch. I'm sure they won't watch, but basically you're not allowed to cook in here because of fire risk because it's like an old building. Okay. So what I have is like an air fryer. Right. And like a little portable hob. I don't know if you know what like a hot plate is. Yeah, like yeah. When you plug into the wall. But they're very small. So like the best I can do is pesto pasta. Is That's that really all been, you've like, the... got here? Yeah, we've got no kitchen. You have to hide it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a microwave downstairs in okay. these places. And um, I'm technically not allowed to have that stuff. So you've got to like hide it under the bed. It's like I put everything out. I've got to wash it in this tiny sink. And this like. guy's got a trouble eating because he's vegan as well. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Well, so is my boyfriend. Really? He's vegan oh, really? cool. too. Yeah. That's hilarious. I can't believe it. That's maybe it. why he hasn't come out as a chef to his Italian parents. Because I'm pretty sure they've like banned vegan meat or something in Italy. Have they? I don't they? know if I'm similar. I might be chatting, but something like that. Yeah. That's quite, that's interesting. But yeah, no, I, I don't think his parents aren't vegan or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's almost like he's got to come out the closet as being being like good at cooking. It's so odd. Um, and so my short film idea was, you know, a sort of ex-military father, you know, who sort of makes out like he's a hard man, but actually worked in the HR department <laughs> and and his mother come to visit him in his third year at university like a guy called Mark in Coventry and he's there with his female housemate and he's cooked all the food and there's this weird sort of tension and it's all building up to him coming out the closet, but him coming out the closet for being a really good cook and, <laughs> and, the, pres and the president of the F Coventry University Food Society and his father won't eat the dessert. And it follows like a three act structure of the starter, the main, the dessert. And then as the parents leave, um, Mark sort of turns around to Jade, his housemate, and goes, I mean, did you see that? I mean, can you imagine his reaction when I do actually come out as gay? You know, it's sort of like a, a double sort of twist sort of that's thing. A, that's a good one. So it's sort of like lightly funny, but a commentary on yeah. um, gender roles. Mm. And, can you expand um, a little bit? Yeah, so the parents the whole time, they're kind of presuming that it's, it's the female housemate that's prepared all of this, this mm. food. Mm. And that they must be in some sort of relationship, but it wasn't in fact her; it was him. You know, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I've not no. thought about it. It was literally if last night. You need night, to call you know? someone. Yeah, you know, I'd love to break on. This guy was on Netflix, to be fair. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so it's like a Michael Mopogo cartoon adaptation. <laughs> okay. It was only on Netflix for like two years. It was eleven. I didn't get enough views. I was like ten, and I'm this little kid called Amos who goes to meet Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like a whole bio. It's kind of a biblical thing. It's called On Angels' Wings. Okay. And I'm like this little kid, and I'm like, oh, baby Jesus. Like, okay, so not adult my Jesus. acting moment. You okay. Know, like, yeah. You would be a good casting actually for the role of Thank Mark you. in the mm. in the film. One hundred percent. I, I will <laughs> let you know. You want, I will. Like, for real. You get the audition, but that is a good idea. And 
just just in terms of the industry because I don't really understand it. How would you even go about like turning that into reality? Like, what are the steps? The steps, okay. Yeah. So the steps would be uh, firstly finish the screenplay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Get it out of the notes app on your phone. Though. Yeah, yeah. Try and actually have something in front of me that I can then take to people that could maybe put a bit of money in. I could maybe finance it um, independently. Um, or maybe I could get some sort of funding from maybe BFI or Screen Yorkshire um, or some contacts that I've made throughout my career. Um, or in order to get the funding, one thing that I could do is I could then take it to people that I know that might be interested in coming in and performing with it. And if I was able to mm. then secure a name to maybe play the role of Mark or to play the father, even like I worked with um, Peter Mullen, like someone like Peter Mullen, he would be great at yeah. playing the father. If he, if he was like, yeah, I'll do it. Then it's not really going to have a problem getting funding. Yeah. And it wouldn't need a lot of funding either. I think with like indie films and stuff like that, or make making a short film, um, I've kept it simple, so it's 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 a good idea. But location wise, it's set in in a in a kitchen and in a dining room. So this isn't something. I love that's, that when it's just like one set and it's just all about yeah. like people talking. Yeah, it, it's yeah. it's contained, right? So it's manageable to sort of get a good, you know, a good amount of backing. Another way that I would, um, you know, help it get produced is I'd think about who would be my director of photography. Mm-hmm. So I'd maybe approach somebody that I know that's really good at photography. For example, Ivan Burke, who was the DOP in How to Stop a Recurring Dream. I take it to Ivan and say, are you interested in this? And if he's not interested in it, he might know somebody else that is. Or Joel Honeywell, he's a great DOP. Um, I worked with him on a music video. These are people I'd like to work with again. And if they were interested and they atta- if you can get people to attach their name to it, then it becomes a lot easier to get it funded. It becomes a thing. It becomes real. And then next thing you know, it gets made. That's my understanding of how it works anyway, but I'm not, I've never actually produced anything all the way to the end. So yet. Exciting. Yeah. It makes me think like you're talking about all these connections and kind of thing. Yeah. Obviously you didn't go to drama school or anything. So you came into that world. Did you feel like there's like, is there, is nepotism quite a big thing in the art world? Like in terms of like getting connections, getting auditions. Yeah, of course it is. Nepotism, nepotism is. Um, But I think that we talk about nepotism within the art world and within media because that's what we click on, that's what we look at, that's who we're talking about, right? But nepotism is something that is in, you know, across every single industry, you know. Yeah. What was that like with Bridgerton? I mean, how did you you land that role? Not not accusing you of nepotism, but how how did that even come about in the first place? Um, How did it come about? I, well, I got offered a role on Netflix. I didn't want to do it because there was something a little bit weird about my casting process. So I said, no, Okay. my agent called me crazy. I really? said, I'm not happy about that. Can you tell us about it? Or is it like, you'd rather not? Um, Can uh, you it, tell? Yeah, it was for, uh, it was. Okay. Uh, is that the, like, there's like a Colombian cartel? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Why didn't you want to do that? Um, because it was something just a little bit dodgy about them whether they wanted me to or not, that was the thing getting the answer was just a little bit strenuous about performing simulated sex on stage in Ibiza. Okay. Okay, Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is I think, you know, if you're wanting somebody to do something like that, or it states that on the audition sides and offers are coming in very quickly, but you're not really getting an answer you know, it, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I said no to that. My, my, my agent at the time wasn't happy with it. Um, but I was filming Cobra with Marissa Rabella. Mm. And that's where I met uh, Robert Kalio and Lucy Kohu. I spoke to Robert and Lucy about what had happened. And Lucy said, well, I'll speak to my agent. I didn't think she actually would. And she did. A week later, I'd signed at a new agency. And about two weeks later, after signing, um, the audition for Bridgerton came through. Mm. I went in. Ah, I did the self-tape. I did a self-tape first. Um, I redid the self-tape the next day because I wasn't happy with it. I got a recall. I went down to the recall. There were all these girls there. I didn't know what roles they were up for. Um, And I didn't feel good and I felt a little bit, I don't know, I was a bit done. I went in, I did the audition and I left in a mood. Mm. And that that was that. I had that with them in like my first year exams here. 
Yeah. I had an exam that I thought I absolutely crashed. Yeah. And I like left the thing and I walked off on my own, like crying, whatever, like just like going for a walk. Another exam I thought I smashed. Complete inverse. I completely fucked. Sorry. I completely, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely fucked the one that I thought went really well and the one yeah. that I was like super emotional about. Like I smashed it. Yeah. That's just kind of how it goes. It often is. But you got way. the role. But I got the role. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that, and, and, and that was that. So. How was that? Mm. I just want to talk, um, just taking a little bit of a turn, to something a bit more personal. Um, you've talked about your work with Mind. Yeah. You also work with the Cruise um, Bereavement Support Trust. Yeah. Just if you don't mind opening up a little bit about it, just because I think it could really help people. Could you tell us a little bit about your personal journey with it, why you feel it's important and what the trust does to help people? Okay, so um, I, I stumbled across Cruise Bereavement Support when my father passed away in January this year, really suddenly. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah. These things happen. Um, so yeah, that's that's what happened. Um, I looked up sort of bereavement support because Father's Day was coming around, and um, I wanted to support an organisation that does good things to do with bereavement. Did they help you? Did you go to them for that, or did you just? Yeah, go? they have a lot of information and resources and stories and stuff on on their website um to help you process grief and understand that, that you're not alone um and then they also have a interesting uh, like a very particular focus on supporting young people that have experienced grief um i mean i'm not even that young i thought i'd lose my dad in my 40s and i lost him when i was 26 and i was like oh my god but then i was thinking you know i was at school with kids and stuff when we were like 12 years old and i was people you know a girl and 12 years old and she'd lost her dad and I didn't have any sort of concept of like what she w was experiencing and what she was going through like I knew obviously it was very sad um but I didn't have any sort of real kind of like you understanding kind of realize it until it happens to yeah you, yeah and 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 how it hit me at 26 I was thinking my god like how was you know kids like go through this it's yeah, awful like, right I think when you're 12 like a father figure is so central your upbringing so then yeah. to, not to have that i think but it's not to detract obviously from losing a father at 26 but when you're 12 i feel you're more emotionally mature as well around those kind of things yeah it's really hard and so and so they're just like a really great organization and then they also have like um phone lines with grief specialists where mm. you can call up um and you can talk to somebody about your grief and process it with somebody that's been through it um so yeah, that's why I supported um, Cruise and I reached out to them and I raised a little bit of money for them. I mean, not like a massive amount, but it's a it's a lifelong relationship that I have with them now. Um, I raised as much as I could at the time. And then I was at the Pride of Scotland Awards and I met Irvin Welsh, who's the writer, creator of Train Spotting. Oh, really? Yeah. And okay. I and I was talking to him um about you know what what i've been up to and i mentioned cruise and he told me that cruise you know pretty much saved his mother's life um wow. when she was going through grief and using the phone lines yeah. um wow. and that really solidified in me like you know i'm with the right people here and i'm su supporting the right organization yeah you know i think i think mental health awareness we, we touched on it at, at the beginning of the episode but i think despite the fact that it's 2023 there's so much stigma around it still and people are so because there's so many different mental health issues you can't just group it like i say mental health but it's a bit i'm going against my own views in a way because i don't think you can group it all under an umbrella term mental health there's so many issues there because bereavement and and grief for example is is such a different feeling to um i don't know feeling uh, a sense of identity issues so identity issues or having an issue with social situations where you can't really make friends so mental health can be grouped in so many different categories especially once you bring in issues like bipolar and, mm -hmm. and schizophrenia into into this mix yeah totally yeah. it's it's um it's an interesting it, it it's a hard thing to sort of navigate um because it is very individual Everybody has a different perspective, a different worldview, a different trauma, a different type of support. Um, 
diagnoses. Um, yeah, and I think when we think about mental health in in like the mainstream, we we often think about um, you know depression and anxiety and panic attacks and things that we can sort of deal with. We we don't often really delve into or talk about um, like psychosis or you know thing things of that nature because that is uncomfortable. I mean. I think everybody's biggest fear is going crazy. I think if we were all to really, really ask ourselves what we wouldn't, I mean, like a lot of us, we would rather die. Before I went crazy, I would rather die than go nuts. I think it's like a lack of control though. Yeah, it's a lack of control, a lack of independence, and also this sort of like fear of being being pitied and having people yeah. worry about you and concerned about you, that is horrible. You know, I want to be independent. I want to be perceived as strong. No one really wants to be looked at as being um, vulnerable. Yeah, it reminds me, we had um, a mental health advocate. He has bipolar, I think it's type one. So psychosis is included in that. Yeah. And he was talking about the way that we try and break down mental health stigma at the moment. It's like, oh, it's okay to be sad kind of thing. Yeah. But he said, it's all well and good saying, oh, it's okay for your friend to be depressed. But when they have psychosis, and he's quite obviously, you know, he's quite <laughs> like an over the top example, but he was like, when you think there's a dragon in the room and you're throwing coke cans at it, <laughs> suddenly everyone's like, get my kids the fuck away from this person. Like, kind yeah. of thing. And I think it's like, yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah. yeah. It's a massive difference. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to I mean, be sad, but yeah, you know, it's okay. It's not okay to think there's a dragon. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's, there's there's levels to it. I was, I was wondering. We we touched a little bit on your experience with it, but have you? Are you doing better now? Is that is it? Are things improving? Would you say? Um. Yeah. I mean, like, I feel. I I believe I'm firmly. I don't know. I don't know what a weird <laughs> question. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, because it's a spectrum, isn't it? Like, yeah, um, it is a spectrum. For me, like my psycho. I haven't spoken about this publicly, but for me, I'd go to like like Nazi universes. Like, mm -hmm. I would just see, you know, the Third Reich and everything. Like, I would oh just God. be like. You know, really, really quite dark, like genuinely really quite scary, right? Okay, well. And my friends sort of joke about going Ruby, do you remember when you thought you were Anne Frank? Do you know what I mean? Oh. I know. So that 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 that's how that scary intense. and dark it was. Like and because it was like during um like the first lockdown and stuff. Yeah. And this is sort of how I was thinking. And then I couldn't understand why is everybody wearing masks? Why is there a man in a visor with goggles on and you know, sheets everywhere and it was so clinical and detached and, you know, it was just, you have to do this and these procedures we have to follow, but with no explanation, I couldn't get my mind around it. Um, I forgot the original question. <laughs> if you're doing better now. If I'm doing better now. Well, yes, because I'm not, I'm not in a, in some sort of Nazi video here, game. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? So if I'm to compare it to me at my absolute worst, then yeah, I would say that I am doing better now. Um, but That's that good. doesn't mean that, you know, I don't have like moments of like, especially like grief, like extreme mm -hmm. grief and sadness. Um, I don't know if I'm doing better in that regard, but at least I'm, you know, I'm in this shared reality that I believe we mm. all hold. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, just to move it on to a, a lighter note. It got deep. Yeah. 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 That was amazing. It's, it's, good. Um, it's good. Yeah, to move on to a lighter note, upcoming yeah. projects. You have a movie called Baghead coming out in 2024. Oh, God. On a lighter right? note, you have a movie called the Baghead. Horror movie. On a lighter note, the horror the horror movie. movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I do. I have a movie called um, Baghead, which my granddad likes to remind me baghead in in scotland that's like a, a heroin addict really i don't yeah. i don't think they thought about this when they named okay. the film well, i haven't heard it definitely so they probably didn't think about it but yeah yeah i mean like um yeah it, it is a lighter note because i had a lot of fun when i shot that yeah. we, we all the project. what's fun. the like rough kind of a rough synopsis of plot maybe without <laughs> ruining anything you know like what's the kind of okay so picture this um 
Freya, Siri from The Witcher, plays Irish. Um, Irish. I- Iris. Okay. And Freya, mm. her, her dad dies and she inherits a pub in Berlin. Um, I, I play her best mate. And there's a witch called Baghead in the basement that can bring back people from the dead. <laughs> Scary. And then Jeremy Irvin from Warhorse, he played okay. Pip, turns up as um, a sort of weird guy called Neil. And him and Jeremy and Freya decide that they want to turn Baghead into a kind of business enterprise and extort uh, extort her exploit her powers for money is she like a proper person like you can like, have a chat with baghead and stuff and like be like not Look, really i'll take 50 percent you take 50 percent <laughs> i mean i think they missed a trick here because i think they should have shot it as a comedy to be quite honest really yeah no genuinely for Are real you excited about the project still or it's like um Full honesty, you know, we don't have to publish it anyway. But. No, I'm not excited about the project. I mean, like, it, it was such a laugh to shoot and we had, like, a really, really good time. Like, absolutely no doubt. I only did it because Freya signed up to do it. So okay, I was like, yeah. oh, go on then. If you do it, I'll do it. Kind yeah, of if you do it, I'll do it. I feel like there's not that much press around it, though. No. Like, I, I didn't even really know about it until no. like, I did the online research. Which, which we've, we've been kind of like... um oh, good, it's not came out yet, you know. <laughs> like I get an email, like, you know, it, it feels like it's coming out, like, next year now. And we're like, God, we've got away with it for so long, but eventually this yeah, is it's actually... Yeah, like the stain. Yeah, this I saw, is um, it reminds me of this interview with Seth Rogen. Yeah. And he was talking about the worst day of his life all the time is the day that, like, his movies come out. Yeah. Because he's just, like, petrified of the responses. And even if you get a bunch of positive, like, love or whatever, you did amazing, you get, like, the, this was crap. I yeah. like how they did this. Do you feel that as well? Like the anticipation of it coming out? Yeah, for sure. It's a really, really silly film. I mean, like one one problem that I have with it, well, not really a problem, but I'm just like, what? You know, but we'll just ignore that anyway, is the fact that at no point was it ever explained why she had a bag on her head. She has a bag on her head the whole film. She has a pota- potato sack on her head. <laughs> she was <laughs> she like a person ghost. Like. She was just shuffling around in a basement with a potato sack on her head. <laughs> How does she get there? Like, what, like... Well, the, I know, I know. And also, like, she wears, like, um, sandals. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, her toes are, like, popping out the end of her sandals. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the scariest part of the yeah. whole movie. But it's Crappy ne- toes. I can tell you, it scares it's, me. It's never explained. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's other things, like, at one point, I go into her little cave dwelling thing, and it's just surrounded yeah. in gold coins and chicken bones. <laughs> <laughs> Project. I'm, I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna watch it know. though. You've you've sold it to me though. I'm, 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 I'm gonna text. Watch I'll it. let you know how I find it. You know, I'll be like, it stellar is, performance. It is. Fu- I'm not gonna lie. It is funny, but it was never supposed to be, and that's what kind of made it even more funnier. You know, because we were just like we were cracking up when we were shooting. We had to leave the set at some points because we were just laughing really? so much, and they were like, get off. You know, we'll oh, get. They were getting like, really? Yeah, no, they, they were like, get off. And then, and then the Germans, because we shot it in Berlin, we were like, that is so funny. <laughs> you know, like they took it really seriously and they just didn't. <laughs> what is wrong with these stupid Yeah. Bones? Yeah. It was, this any is other, a serious film. Yeah. Any other projects you're excited about? Anything you can tell or can't tell? Um, yeah. Oh, you know, well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm doing like um, an indie film next year. It's sort of like a football film, set in a football universe football world right um Are but ultimately just before we carry on mm, no okay. but <laughs> i did get very emotional watching the um beckham one the beckham why I am i crying Do you my know sister what I mean? watched it the only scene i've seen is like where you know when victoria beckham is like oh you know we both come from a working class background and then yeah. david is like shut up like <laughs> what car did your dad drive a rolls royce yeah, <laughs> yeah. But no, I was crying at that. I mean, football can be quite emotional, the stories anyway, you know, yeah, within it. Course. It's set in a football universe, but ultimately it's a film about racism. Mm. And it's kind of like Bend It Like Beckham meets This Is England. I love Bend It Like Beckham. Right? Yeah. And luckily, I'm not playing football. Well, you would have had to train for that. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I, I'm not doing that. You're not you get a stunt no. double, you know. No, no, I'm just not, I'm just not a oh, footballer, yeah, yeah. in it. Um, yeah. So can you tell, like, just for our listeners... You tell like a name, something for them to get excited about, maybe a date 
or is this, the name is this of all confidential? It's all it's all confidential. Um, I've got a meeting about it uh, with the producer that picked me this week okay. or, or next week now, and um, I believe it is backed by like the FA. So that's wow, really exciting. So that's and um, also there was like an other project. And the thing is, I don't know what's been going on for the last four months. It's been it's been the weirdest thing. I can't say what it is, but the whole process has has made me feel like I'm screaming at the wind. But I guess that's just that's just the industry. But it would be well funny if it came through. But I just don't know. Who knows? Okay. You really? know? Is, it, is it like everything a bit vague or, or what's, what's, what's the issue here? Um, well, it was... It, it's, it's just amazing. very vague. It's very vague. I, I think the thing is, you can have these conversations, you can have these verbal contracts or whatever, but unless, a, you know, in any sort of business, unless the real contract is signed up and pen is on paper, mm -hmm. it's not real, right? Yeah. It's not real yet. So for yet. Me, yeah. So I think we're kind of running out of time. We yeah. End yeah. it on that hopeful note. Yeah. It's a good Ruby, note to end on. It's a good note to end on. Yeah. Ruby, thank you so much for coming on. Thank it's you. It's been really guys. fun. It's a nice been fun. chill conversation. So everybody, tune in for the next episode. This has been Ruby Barker. Thank you so much. This has been the Loaf Podcast. And Ruby, if you'd had anything you'd like to say to our listeners, any concluding thoughts, not to put you on the spot, but this is your time. <laughs> Do I deliver here? Yeah, you go okay. for it. Hello, listeners. I hope you're having a lovely day and um, take care of yourselves. Thanks for listening to me. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been the Loaf Podcast. We're signing off. Mm -hmm.